from the fastest ways to make gold to the best way to level your character, here are 25 tips you need to know in Dragon's Dogma 2. Going around the map, you'll find some small bugs known as Golden Trove Beetles, and these things, believe it or not, are actually pretty important. If you go into your inventory, you'll find the option to consume them, and when you do, your maximum weight capacity will increase. There is a limited number of these in your world, but you could set a pawn quest for other players to retrieve you some. Essentially, this means you could have infinite weight if enough players complete your quest. Weight will continue to be a problem throughout the game, so techniques like this are really helpful to know. You're going to find out fairly quickly how important Worm's Life Crystals are. They're going to give you some pretty crazy advantages that'll be explained later on in the video, but to prepare for that, you need to learn what is the best way to farm them. But there's one thing we have to understand first, which is that the only way to obtain these crystals are by slaying dragons, otherwise known as drakes. There are multiple locations set around the map that have drakes waiting for you, but they can be hard to fight if you're just starting out, and for spoiler reasons I won't show where you can find them. However, if you do want a quick way to grab a few, you can purchase some and abundance of other ores at this merchant that walks along the front of Urnworth. There's also a couple places around the map, but they're usually next to the drakes, so unless you're ready to fight them, you'll be in for a long battle. You probably already know there's a leveling system put in place, where with each level up you get a number of stats increased. One thing the game doesn't tell you though is that your base stats are permanently increased according to your current location. So if you spend most of the game leveling up as a fighter and then suddenly switch to a mage, your base stats will be wildly different to fit that of a fighter and not a mage. The only thing that has changed are your vocation specific stats, which is automatically switched to whichever vocation you choose. So yes, while you are at a slight disadvantage if you decide to switch vocations later in the game, it's nothing that can't be fixed with the correct equipment. If you get the right gear, it should balance all the stats just enough that no matter how drastic they are for what they should be, it still won't be enough to make a difference that would affect your gameplay. It would have been better if your base stats automatically changed like your vocation specific stats every time you switch classes, but thankfully we can still get away with it by just changing out our gear. In the end though, this is still pretty clever, and it's much better than having to restart a character just to try out a new vocation. This gives everyone freedom to experience the unique classes on their own without restrictions of being glued to just one type of build. This also slightly helps the fact there's only one character save slot, yet it's still not enough to make up for it, but at least it's nice to have. Your pawns can actually help you more than you think. If you pay attention to your pawn specializations, you can hire a pawn with a certain skill. For example, some specializations can interpret elvish language or even bargain items in your inventory for gold. Out of what I think are the two best, I first recommend Chirurgeon, where a pawn can heal you and everyone else in your party, using various curatives to fit the current situation, and then Logistician, which allows one of your pawns to combine and move around items in your inventory. I love to pair these two together because of how much time they save. I don't have to constantly go back in my inventory to combine everything I've recently collected. Same goes for healing. If I don't have the time to heal one of my pawns because I'm in a battle, my pawn will just do it for me instead. These two work so well together because one is making curatives and the other is using them to heal everyone else. And if you don't like the specializations of your main pawn, you can always change it using one of these tomes. Gold is a constantly traded currency in the game, virtually needed for anything you want to buy. And knowing that, here are some of the quickest ways to farm gold, ranking from the worst to best. The first way is pretty simple, and that's basically just to grind out the main storyline quest. These offer loads of gold, especially when you get to the Batal region of the map. The third best way to get gold is by selling gemstones. While this isn't completely reliable because gemstones are uncommon, they can definitely get you a couple of bags. When you do sell them, make sure you look at the specific locations they hint at. These places will offer the best selling prices. Moving on, the second best way to farm gold are by killing zombies, bandits, and goblins. These guys have the highest drop rates for gold, so naturally you'll want to find large waves of them and set aside a little time to farm. There are lots of farming locations around the map, but my personal favorite is the Misty Marshes during the night. That's where most of the undead will spawn. Finally, the quickest way to make gold is by completing pawn quests set by other players. You'll find a lot of players are really generous with the rewards for the simple tasks they offer. You can make upwards to 10,000 gold just for killing a cyclops. The best strategy is to get two pawns out of the same quest and complete them at the same time, then go back to the rift and rinse and repeat. The director of Dragon's Dogma 2 quotes, Travel is boring? That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. While his claim is true to an extent, with plenty of enemies and obstacles placed around the map, it doesn't change the fact that walking can still be pretty tiresome in open world games, and unfortunately for us, there aren't many options for fast travel in Dragon's Dogma 2. But thankfully, there are two quicker ways to get around. First is the ox cart. While commonly known, you can pay a small fee of 100 gold to get a ride, and the best part about it is you can sleep off the trip. If I ever need a quick way to get to Melv or Vernworth, I know I can always rely on this. Next are port crystals, and while they're not as convenient as an ox cart, you can place up to 10 of these around the map. You can find them in certain towns too, like Harv or Vernworth. You'll be able to fast travel between any of these, but the only way to activate them is if you use a fairy stone. You can purchase either of these at specific vendors, like the one at Bay West Side Shrine located in Batal. The official way to get there requires you to complete all of Captain Brent's quests. No spoilers though. Remember when I talked about Worms Life Crystals? You'll need those to buy port crystals and fairy stones, but to find the merchant who sells them, you'll need to make your way to Back Batal and reach the beach from there, and go over to the road across the scene you'll find the merchants, known as the Dragon 
Forge, who can sell you the port crystals and the fairy stones. And for our little bonus tip, there's five free Worms Life crystals sitting next to him. He doesn't just sell port crystals and fairy stones though, he offers you the ability to upgrade your equipment to his final stage. I was surprised and excited to discover this, and that's also when it hit me just how important Worms Life crystals are. One thing I wish I knew sooner was that you can actually split your weight between your pawns. I've gone through a fair portion of the game being heavy or nearly encumbered, and it was annoying especially because I made my character big enough to carry a lot of weight. It really put a strain on my movement speed, and I always had to sell a handful of my equipment just to make up for it. That was until I learned you can actually split it with your pawns. Despite the give button being there every time I clicked on an item in my inventory, it never hit me to try it until way later in the game. And don't worry about losing any equipment you give them. If they return back to their master, anything they had in their inventory is sent to your storage. Talking about storage, this leads us into our next tip, and this is super helpful to know so pay attention. Food has a tendency to spoil quickly, and it's annoying when you finally go to rest at a campfire and find that you can't use anything you collected from the previous adventure. However, there's one awesome trick to avoid this. Any food you put in your storage won't spoil. No matter how much time passes, any piece of meat, berries, or fruit stored away won't go to waste. If there is any best piece of advice I could give for this game, it would be to get distracted. The map is about four times larger than the first game, which means there are a lot of things to explore, and at one point or the other, you're going to have to come back to it. And if you don't, then you're just missing out on tons of new equipment, XP, and secret items. It might take a while to complete the main quest, but that's okay, because you'll have to do it anyway. And with that being said, every fork in the road, detour, or side quest you find, just do it. You'll be thanking yourself when you do. Going back to pawns, make sure you remember to switch them out often. When you enter a rift, you're offered a wide selection of pawns to choose from, all varying in different skill sets and builds. But one thing that stands out the most are their levels. Their levels will ultimately determine how powerful they are, of course keeping in mind equipment and gear, but it's important to know you want to replace your pawns every time you gain a few levels yourself. You can get a pawn that's upwards to 10 levels higher than you are, so switching out a pawn that's level 15 for one that's level 20 makes a huge difference. And since we're on the topic, this moves us on to our next tip. There's something more to your pawns than you might have thought, and I definitely didn't realize this until later. They actually have personalities that affect your gameplay, called inclinations, and I was more or less confused when I chose mine. There are four to pick from at the start of the game. Simple, kind-hearted, calm, and straightforward. And while they all have their special abilities, I found that the simple inclination is the best. Your pawn will point out things you missed and will grab any items along the way, like harvesting a bush of berries, looting a treasure chest, or even reminding you about a ladder you walked by. Of course, there are other scenarios where you want to use a different inclination, but given most of the time you're traveling from point A to point B, I would rather have everything collected around me and put my pawns to work versus them standing around until they're actually useful. More often than not, I've been finding myself stumped with some of these quests. I love how the game doesn't hold your hand, but there are just some parts that I'm stuck wandering around hours for trying to figure out what to do. In a time like that, I'll search up a quick guide or tutorial to help me out. We're all working on a schedule, so don't feel bad if you need help with a certain part of the game. Buying and equipping new gear is a fundamental part of building your character, but make sure you do it for your main pawn too. If they're weak in battle, so are you. There are merchants and vendors all over the map to sell you strong gear, but one of my favorites is a merchant named Mudang in the Nameless Village. He has some great armor and weapons you can get early compared to some of the later merchants in the game. You can get to the Nameless Village by heading to the east side of the map. You'll find the road is blocked off, so you'll want to head into the forest next to it and work your way to a campsite you passed up earlier. Now you'll want to pass through the small opening between the two cliffs. Keep following the trail and you'll be on your way to the Nameless Village. There is a little surprise waiting for you in the forest though, so keep an eye out. As for our 14th tip, you might want to pay a little extra attention to your surroundings. Randomly you can find hidden coins known as Seeker's Tokens, and when you get enough of them, you can exchange them for rewards at a guild hall. There are 240 of these coins placed around the map, so you're going to be looking for these for a while. The rewards you can get are pretty good, like rings and armor. They're expensive though, so don't expect to purchase everything at once. You may not have known that there is a free way to get a house early in the game. We all know how frustrating it can be trying to camp out in the wilderness or being flat broke that you can't afford a night at the inn. But don't worry, because if you haven't already, head over to Vernworth and walk past the merchant's quarter. You'll find this lady that wants you to watch over her house for seven days. For rent free, you'll be allowed to stay here until she gets back, and even use her storage in the meantime too. And even after your seven days are up, you'll be allowed to purchase the home for 20,000 gold. Not a bad price for a house if you ask me. Later on, one piece of armor will cost you well over 40,000 gold, so take this deal while you can. There are towers placed all over the map, and if you've taken the time to explore some of them, you'll find many of them have about three to five chests in each one. These are a great way to snatch some valuable materials and items, and they also have a ballista at the top too. Passing on to our 17th tip, it's good to frequently purchase items at different merchants every day. It takes a couple of in-game days for a merchant to restock, so it's good to buy out whatever you need from them so that timer can start. That way, whatever you need to use those materials, you'll always have plenty on hand. After fighting a strong boss or discovering a vault full of treasure, make sure to save your game. There's been many times I'll fight multiple bosses one after the other in a short period of time, but I end up dying on the final one, setting me back to my last save before I fought any of them. I could have avoided 
avoided all of this if I just saved once or twice between boss fights, which would have saved me so much more time in the long run. But because I didn't, I was forced to have to redo everything I just worked for, so don't make the same mistake I did and remember to save. Raw ingredients can weigh a lot if you don't do anything with them. To fix that problem, combine all of those herbs and materials to make yourself less heavy and actually have consumables to use. To celebrate for our 20th tip, here's a way to kill enemies and bosses faster. If you do a little research, you can figure out which status effects your opponents are weak to. The awesome part is that debilitations and status effects stack together, letting you do insane amounts of damage if you combine the two. Something you might want to do more of is to prepare certain potions and consumables for your next adventure. If you plan on fighting a bunch of harpies, it's best to bring a handful of waking powder potions, or if you're going out on a long run, make sure to have some harspud roberance with you. Augmentations are a crucial part of advancing your character. They are essentially perks that grant you some major buffs, and you obtain them by leveling up your vocation. The awesome thing about it though is that even if you switch vocations, you can still equip any augments you use from previous vocations, allowing you to experiment with different play styles. So to get the best out of this, when you max out a vocation, make sure to switch right away to a different one so you're not wasting any time, and that'll help balance out your base stats too. There are multiple ways to get rift crystals, known as RC. That's done by either stumbling upon them in a treasure chest or activating a rift stone. However, the best way to get rift crystals is by getting other players to hire your pawn. The next time that happens and you rest at a house or an inn, your pawn will report back to you with the quest log talking about all the things they did together. You'll see in the quest log that you received a certain amount of rift crystals. The rift crystals price is determined by the level difference between you and the pawn you want to hire. So while you can't set the amount of cost for someone to hire your pawn, you should still be able to make bank from this simple tactic. The only problem is trying to convince players to hire your pawn, but I think you know what to do. Bosses like Griffins, Ogres, and Cyclopses have a respawn timer, but that respawn timer is only activated when you spend time away from the region they spawned in. For smaller bosses like Cyclops and Ogres, it takes 3 days for them to respawn, and more prominent bosses like Dregs and Chimeras take 7 days. And knowing this, let that move us on to our final tip. Using that respawn timer strategy I just talked about, you can essentially create a farm route around the map that covers multiple bosses at once. Take a certain region around the map and hunt down all the bosses in there. Leave the region for the next one and hunt all the bosses in there too. Repeat this cycle until the bosses in the first region to spawn back. Or if you're just focused on one region, kill the boss you want and leave that region to rest for 3 or 7 days, either by dozing off on a bench or resting at an inn. Then go back to whatever hunting spot you want and grind away. As a reward for staying until the end of the video, here's the 26th bonus tip. One thing we've all been waiting for is the chance to change our appearance without the annoying cost of microtransactions. Since the new update just dropped, now we can. Going to the Pawn Guild in Vernworth, you'll find a new tome called the Art of Metamorphosis. For 500 Rift Crystals, you'll be able to change you or your main pawn's appearance, but in order to use it you have to take the book to a barber. Those are 26 tips you need to know in Dragon's Dogma 2. Thanks for watching and subscribe!